let's just jump right in it, man. All right. Sweet Holy Spirit. Man, that was that was kind of nuts because how it all evolved was, I did that first record um, at the at the church on 103rd. Yeah. I just did that session. It was me, Daniel Weatherspoon, Calvin, and um, and Rick. Mm -hmm. at the time so they brought me in to play bass they had a guy named i forgot phil, his name was phil oh yeah phil phil, phil, phil played bass yeah. at the church so i kind of like split the record with him he did a few songs and then we did the rest of the songs so that first record what um what was on that it's a joy and all that stuff mm -hmm. when mark hubbard wrote it and the vibe was so killing yeah. and um i did the session it was vibing mm -hmm. and i think a year later uh, they hired me to play at the church so nice. when i wasn't on the road Calvin's dad was the minister of music at the time. He yes. hired me to play at the church. And so before the next record, we would just be playing at the church and those songs were introduced in rehearsal. Wow. So we was vibing with the songs throughout church services, just testing it out, see how it worked with the people. Mm -hmm. And then we started getting like a vibe, man, just chem chemistry. Um, me and Calvin was like playing together a lot outside of that as well. So man, it was time to cut the record. We was like, oh, we, we in church service. This is what we been doing. Yeah. But it was church, but it was the level of professionalism with session, because that's what I did. Yeah. You know, I was like, we cutting the record. Yeah. So we would be in rehearsals, man, and it was thought out. Hey, man, I'm not going to play in that space. Calvin, uh-uh, this, we going to let this bridge breathe. Mm -hmm. It was just all this communication on how to make this record just hit. But we didn't know it was going to blaze like that. We just knew we it felt good to us, and we loved what we was doing. But you the impact to the, the people, I'm yeah, talking. Tell the Devil I'm Back. That record was... And which I ain't do no overdubs on that record, neither did Calvin. It was what you heard was what you play, was played that night. Nobody went and fixed nothing. Cause the vibe was so, it was so crazy, bro. It was amazing, man. And Calvin on them drums at, the, at that church. Whew, man, Calvin, I don't know what to say about that boy. It's like <laughs> me and his energies matched. It's like rhythmically, it was like, we ain't had to talk about it. It just be like, it just, it was crazy. And then to have Vashon there, he was writing his butt off, Rick yes, writing that stuff writers. and arranging. And then we would bring Joy, he wasn't a member of the church, we would bring Joy in to play guitar. Yeah. And Joy was the butter. I call him butter sauce. Bruh. So Joy was on that, man. And we had um, Brian Lofton on the organ. Yeah. So that was just a historic moment, man, that I just thank God that I was a part of, man. It, 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 it reminds you of that Tommy's thing, you know what I mean? We yeah. had that kind of camaraderie, you know, as a band, you know, we was, rehearsing together, we was hanging out together, we'd be at each other's crib, we liked each other, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it was it was a vibe, man, it was a blessing. I remember uh, we was, and I'ma jump to, I was on the road with Destiny's Child, we way off in London somewhere, Africa or somewhere, and we at the bottom of the stage, we about to count off Independent Woman, this dude say, Maurice, sweet Holy Spirit, I love you. I was like, dude, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> YouTube wasn't even like blazing like that at that point. But he had that record. So Go ahead. the Destiny Child came about. It's so crazy how that came about. I was out with Fred Hammond at the time, mm -hmm. and he was doing this. He was trying that this this stage play thing. We was out for maybe about six, seven months, man, just with his whole his whole thing. And um, I got a call, and it was Rodney East. Uh -huh. Rodney was like, yo, what you doing, fam? What you doing? I'm like, I'm chilling. I'm out on with Fred. Man, you want to go out with Destiny's Child, man? Wow. I said, dude, stop playing. He said, dude, I just talked to Michelle and um, Ethan is about to go do Johnny Jackson, and it's a slot. If you want it, man, she'll put in the word with Beyonce for you. I was like, do I want it? Yes. So she got on the phone. Hey, Maurice. OK, I'm up. you're going to get a call. And I got a call from Kimberly Burst who was kind of running their whole thing as far as putting their bands together and staging and all that stuff. And uh, she was like, yeah, the girl saw you on um, on the Kimberell joint live in Memphis. They, man, they, cause they was like, you, you sound good. And oh, yeah, you can do the gig, right come down time. to LA. And so I was just finishing up that Fred thing. I flew to LA and um, at the time, um, I, who was on drum? Um, Jamie Campbell was the drummer, yeah. but he was in Jamie transition. Jones. He was losing, leaving, and they were like about to pick a new drummer mm -hmm. and the bass player slot. So I met Rob Bacon at the rehearsal. At first he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't, 
Rob, you my man now. We good. <laughs> but Rob wasn't the most accepting in that mm -hmm. for, to me because he, he didn't choose me. Oh, right, right. Because you know how that is. You got yeah. your L.A. guys lined up. You want your guys that you familiar with. He yeah. wasn't familiar with me. He wasn't a gospel guy. Yeah. So he was like, oh, you know, okay, we'll see what you can do. Yeah, all right, man. Mm -hmm. Cool. You the one they pick, cool. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but we good, Rob. My man. That's my dude to yeah. this day. But anyway, so I went to the audition. And basically, we were rehearsing for um, some TV show. It was um, on Channel Five. Like, what's the Channel Five day show? The, the show that they do outside. So we were we were going over the stuff. And before, let me let me go back some. Mm -hmm. So they had sent me the music. I had a videotape of Ethan and them playing at this rodeo show in Texas. I don't know if you ever seen it. It's amazing, oh, okay. blazing. Mm -hmm. Ethan was killing. So I had that videotape, mm -hmm. videotape, not a CD. I got my little video recorder in my room out with Fred, and I'm trying to pick out the key bass parts, and because you had to play key bass on that. And I was like, oh, I'm rusty with that. Let me shake off the dust. Mm -hmm. So I'm picking out the parts so I can prep for it. So I got there, and everybody know, man, I get a gig, I'm a prep doc. Yeah. I want to know the music. I don't want nobody hollering, B flat, yeah. C sharp. That ain't, you can't enjoy music like that. So I always like to know what was happening. So I learned the music, got down there, they count the songs off. I was knocking them down, knocking them down. It started feeling good. And so it went for so for two weeks. I went and did the TV show. They did a switch out with the drummers. Um, I called Calvin first. Mm -hmm. Calvin had just got the, the Rob gig, so he couldn't come out. And so Kahari just so happened to be rehearsing next door at SRI. We was at SRI rehearsing. He was with some saxophone guy. And I said, dang, I said, Kahari, what you doing when you get back to the crib? I'm chilling. I said, all right, man, I might call you, bro. We get we went to London with Destiny's Child, and my man Donnell Spencer was playing drums, and they and Donnell was doing a good job, but they just wanted to do something different, and so Rob came to me like, "Who you want to play with?" Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, let me backtrack. Yeah. He finally walked up to me after the London gig and was like, "You got the gig, man," yeah. but he wouldn't tell me for weeks, right. and I've been playing with them. I was like, oh, "Thank you, Jesus." <laughs> So he wanted to see what I did after that show, that big mm -hmm. show, and he gave me the gig. And um, he said, who you want to play with on drums? I said, well, you know, it's either Calvin or, you know, I got to see it. I said, but my boy Kahari, he's dope. He said, all right, I'll check him out, send him the stuff. So I told Kahari about it. Um, Rob called him. Kahari met us in L.A. after we got back from London. Came in that joint and blazed. Yeah. Song, he, every song, we just counting songs down. One, two, blazing them all. He knew the whole show, bro. Wow. And that's how that all came about. From Rodney East, my man, 50 Grand, Absolutely. put me on that gig, man. And that gig changed my life. That was a, that was my first major pop gig outside of gospel music. You know what wow. I mean? Beyonce would be on that stage, man. She had a little segment where she do her own thing. Mm -hmm. I said she definitely finna be like a major solo you artist saw that star. Gig? Oh my God, it was crazy. So even her her music ability was just she would be the ones come to band rehearsals and like oh what y'all doing what y'all playing I want to sing like she's very involved musically oh, wow. man she's a beast wow like so she was she was incredible bro Pentecost Chicago and they was doing their first recording when they got ready to do the recording they brought Dan um, Darius Brooks in and Sanchez Harley to produce it yeah. so I remember the day it was a Saturday Dan was like. Maurice, Darius wants you to come to the church and rehearse. And so I'm like, cool, I'm all excited. I get there and it's just Darius and us in the band. And he counted off the song and we started playing. He's like, wait a minute, stop. When the last time you changed your strings? <laughs> I was like, I don't know, I ain't had the money. I bored them the other week, but them strings sound terrible. You know what, let's just cut to the chase. Y'all not doing this record. Mm. I was like, what? I said, y'all not ready. He said, I, you know, the level I do, I do the Tommies, I do, y'all, I'm bringing Sanchez, you just not ready. Man, I went home and I cried mm. so hard, bro. And I was heartbroken because I, I was like, man, I play for this choir, I've been all over the city with them, why can't I do the record? My mama came to my room, rest in peace, mama. She came to my room, she's like, I'm gonna pray for you, that God give you something special that one day you can record with them. She said, I want you to go to all the rehearsals, whether you're recording or not. Go anyway. I was like, okay. My mom prayed for me, and I went to all the rehearsals. And when I got there, it was Richard Gibbs, Al, Lamar Jones, mm. Darius played piano, and um, Al Willis. And they brought a, a drummer in from Nashville. It's kind of named Steve Smith or something. He was 
bad. Mm -hmm. And man, they started playing them songs I had been playing all year, but they sounded way different. Mm -hmm. I knew why I wasn't chosen. They was killing, bro. I said, this is, this is it. I went, so I went to every rehearsal. During the day, I was at the rehearsal. I get out of school, I go right up to that church and watch them do it. And I saw the magic that they was putting together. And I said, I don't have that. I need to get that. And I sat around them and Calvin Bridges had a song on there. And Calvin said, you're gonna play two of my songs. And he, they let me play two songs and the rest Lamar and them did. And it was blazing. Um, John P. Key was a special guest to sing a duet with Pastor Willis. He brought his whole choir. They had just did a gig the day before mm -hmm. in Chicago. And John sat through the whole session until his song came up. And when Don, John sang his song, he was walking off. He, went, he looked in the pit and said, young man, you sound good. I've been listening to you all night. Mm -hmm. You sound good. Now, Baxter, I just got kicked off the record before. Yeah. But this session, John P. Key telling me I sound good. I was like, mama, oh, God, your prayers. <laughs> And so that was that. And then they came up and John closed out the concert. He brought his choir up and it was Coon, Calvin Napper, we call him Coon, mm -hmm. and Michi, yeah. two piece. And they said, young boy, you wanna sit in with us? What? I sat in with them and we was jamming. Right. Jesus is real, never shall forget all that stuff. And then John went home, I went home, I was on a high, I was excited. I said, John told me I could play. I did the session and I nailed it. My first major recording like that. And um, a week later, I got home from school. And my mom was like, hey, John P. Key, somebody called. And she, they called looking for you. They called the house. John had called around the city and got my number. And he got it from um, Richard Gibbs, my mama, Anna S. Andrews, because she he had called her saying, well, you ask Richard, who that young boy on the base? Wow. And they gave him my phone number. This is pre-Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. You had to call somebody to find Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And they called, and, his, and Jeanette, I called the number back, and Jeanette said, John was so impressed with you. He wants you to come to North Carolina and play for, for New Life. They was the biggest, they was the biggest choir at that time, dude. I said, I couldn't believe it. I took that $400 I made with Dan Willis, <laughs> bought me a Greyhound bus ticket, and rode on that bus that all the way to North Carolina on a Greyhound bus, bro. Wow. I ain't had no blanket. I was freezing. You know, that bus be cold. Man, we stopped at every city. I was like, Lord, have mercy. I didn't know it was like this. I finally got in there that night. Rehearsed with Michi them for about two hours. Got on the bus. Mm -hmm. First show was in New York at Stanley Brown them church. Mm -hmm. It was like a surreal moment. And that's how I met John, and that's how I got the gig, man. How I even became a bass player was so cool, so weird. I was in the bass, I was in the alley playing ball with my brother. Mm -hmm. We hooping. That's what we did. We had a, we had a rim on the pole, yeah. and some family was moving out their crib, bro, and they had threw a lot of stuff in the garbage. And in the right next to the garbage can was a bass, wow. and the head it was broke right here. It was cracked, uh -huh. so it was a four string. It only had an E and an A on it. Wow. I took it in the crib. A two-string? Clean two-string. I took it in the crib, and I had just got a Darius Hope tape from my brother mm -hmm. with the Tommies. I started learning how to play Steve Huff bass parts with two strings, just trying to pick it out, playing it through my tape deck with my stereo system, because I ain't had no amp. And two it had strings. them, you remember? Dude, Come two on, strings. Man. And I was on there like, Darius Hope. <laughs> 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 trying right. to pick out the notes. And man, my uncle heard about that I was trying to learn bass and they had a quartet group. He was like, man, I'm gonna get you a bass. He gave me a four string. Mm -hmm. And then from there, my mom, I would learn gospel stuff. And then my daddy was like, he wasn't no church guy. He was like, this is the stuff you need to learn. You need to Frankie Beverly and some Steve Lee Dan. And nah, 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 nah. He, bring, he brought me a stack of records cause I had a turntable, you know, the little flip suitcase yeah, turntable yeah, yeah. and my tape deck. And that's how I would learn. And I just started learning bass. And as a freshman in high school, I was in the drum section and I didn't play bass. The next year going to school, I came in and like, I play bass, y'all. They yeah. was like, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. I was like, I do. Man, I plugged up, man. I was like, King. They was like, oh, snap. <laughs> so they was like, my band teacher, he started teaching me how to read out of the fake book. Mm -hmm. And I got in the jazz band at school, in high school at Marshall, Mr. O'Banion and Mr. Harry Hunt. Wow. They started teaching me. And then, man, when you become a bass player in high school, yeah. Sheree, you the man. Yeah, absolutely. Bass players was like the popular <laughs> thing. That, man, like, he played bass. Oh. And so we had a gospel choir there. And the gospel choir had a bass player named Wanderer Booker. He was their bass player. Mm -hmm. 
But I came in, they said, Maurice play bass. I came in there and Keep the Faith was popular. Mm -hmm. If you could play Keep the Faith by Myrna Summers, mm -hmm. you was bad. Uh -huh. And I had picked it out and I played it in there. And they said, the, the choir teacher's like, you the new bass player now. <laughs> the other guy over there like, I'm gonna kick your butt. I'm like, oh man, dude, I just, and he was my homie. So I went to lunch, man, I come back. They said, man, one drill at the top, man, he about to throw your bass over the banister. Oh I'm about to God. break this bass, took my gig. Oh. I'm like, dude, come on, man, don't do this. <laughs> this happened for real, bro. <laughs> he mad because I took a quiet gig. Uh -huh. So that was my first journey to playing bass. That happened for real. My inspiration for bass mm -hmm. was Steve Huff. Mm -hmm. Because he was so different from anything I ever heard, like recording like gospel bass. Yeah. I wasn't from LA, so I didn't I didn't get to hear Goucher till like later. And I, I was hearing him, but I didn't know it was him. Right. But my direct influence was Steve Huff because he was right here in Chicago. And bro, that I would try to learn everything he played verbatim because I figured if I could play the notes he played, mm -hmm. I'm bad. Right. And so he inspired me. And so I took when I got with John, I had the Chicago approach to bass. Mm -hmm. Like that whole Tommy's, <clears throat> that whole groovy thing. With John P. Key, that's where I really learned how to play live music, man. Mm -hmm. Like live. John had this thing like, hey, man, don't be worried about no sound check. We gonna get there. Y'all plug up and play. We didn't come up with all that. Give me something in my monitor. You better plug in that amp. If you can hear yourself, we gonna get down. Like, it was like, ooh, he was like boot camp, man. Mm -hmm. He was tough, bro. And he was, he taught us how to play, man. And bro, we would get out there, man, and we would destroy these churches and destroy these arenas. Yeah. And John was a country boy. He would go do a big theater. We can play the United Center. Then he'll find, Jeanette, find me a little church to go do after we leave here. Wow. And we'll go on the way from, we'll do a tour. We'll start with 30 days with all confirmed theaters. And then we then he'll build churches around that. So we'll be out three, four months wow. based on his relationships and his, I want to go play at a little church. Let's put a concert together. Mm -hmm. And man, we get out there, man. It was every day playing like that. You become aggressively, like, you. it was like, we finna kill every night because yeah. that's how he was. Yeah. It was a blessing. That John changed my life musically. And he put me, he gave me that national platform. Like, Show Up was the first time nationally that people heard me. Whew. And Show Up was recorded with a key bass and all of that stuff. And he wrote that song from Never Shall Forget. It was the vamp, we was playing, yeah, yeah. we was playing Never Shall Forget, and we was just sitting, he say, God will show up. And he wrote that on tour. He say, we gonna record them when we get to the crib. Mm -hmm. And they, he said, meet you, take young boy in there and record this on bass. And I recorded Show Up on bass at uh, White Room Studios in Charlotte. Ooh. And it was the game changer. That was the first. Yes, it was. Everybody, oh, who is that young boy on bass? It all started from there. I was like 18 years old, 17, 18 years old. John, man, I love that dude, man. He, he really blessed my life, bro, in terms of being the musician that I am right now. Mm -hmm. It started with Dan Willis giving me that platform getting kicked off the session by Darius Brooks, who's my man now, that's my mm -hmm. man 50 grand. And to have the opportunity to, to record again and then John recognized me through that situation was amazing. How the Fred thing came about, yeah. I had made a departure from John. I left John, I had just got married. I left John or whatever. And just, you know, no, 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 made, no beef or nothing like, I just knew you know, I just always had this thing like, my time is up, I gotta do something different. Yeah. And so I left at the time, and then I was at the crib, and I got that phone call, and it was Fred Hammond. He called me directly. Wow. He said, hey man, Eric Donkers gave me your number. I heard you wasn't with John, and I'm about to go on tour. I need a bass player. Terrence is going off to do stuff with Israel and do other stuff. He said, you want to do the gig? I was like, first I thought somebody was playing a prank. Right. I said, man, this ain't no Fred. He's like, uh -huh, yes it is. I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> so I got the Fred gig, man. I got there and I was like hungry. I'm like, God, you done blessed me with another platform. Right. I'm ready, let me just blaze this with all my might. Give me the inspiration to contribute to this thing, man. And he just blessed me. We did our first, I did a, a tour with them. Um, we did the tour 
and then we did the um, Live in Vegas. Mm -hmm. It was me, Aaron Lindsay was in the band at the time too. Israel was the guitar player with us. Get out of here. Israel, when I first met Israel, he hadn't even did his record yet. Let me go back, Terrence yeah. didn't leave for Israel yet. No, he wasn't even, it wasn't even, that didn't, didn't even happen yet. Wow. Terrence just moved on. Mm -hmm. Israel, Fred was supposed to produce Israel's first record. Mm -hmm. So Israel was on the road with Fred. Fred was like, man, just come sing with me and play acoustic guitar yeah. and be in the band with us. Israel was my roommate. Wow. We were sharing rooms. And that was my man. Yeah. We planned, that's how I met him. And then Aaron Lindsay, I would always be playing video games in my room every night. Everybody came to play 2K or NBA yeah. all night in the room. Mm -hmm. And so Israel was like, dude, I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> I said, dude, that ain't my fault. We play the game. We're a gamer. Play the, play the game. Right. And so he was like, I'm going to switch with Aaron Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Him and Aaron Lindsay switched rooms and became roommates. And then when they switched rooms, they started planning Israel's record. Oh. They, that's how they started talking yeah. about doing the first record. And they did that first record, and it blew up. So and Israel, we laugh about it. He said, thank you, Maurice. You right. are part of my success <laughs> playing the video games. I switched rooms with you when with Aaron. And now this is happening. Wow. Crazy, John. Everybody got a story about me, Everybody. bro. <laughs> Ask Israel about this. So, bro, that's how that came about. It was just sessions. Then I hooked up with Kevin Bond. Oh, he put I me on the TD scene. Jakes yeah, record. Yeah. He was like, oh, my, let's play my routes. You know, <laughs> you're going to learn me yet. Absolutely. You know, it was like, I, that was a whole other style oh, of playing my. with them cats. That dude was like, mm, oh, my, yes. boom. Where yes. you at? Yes. You know, so you learn a whole nother way. It's like he called it routes. Yes. He played them big drops and you had to be there. Whatever oh you God. played between getting there, you better be there. Yeah. And that's a whole that's that that's LA all. sound. That's that yeah. Hawkins vibe. And so to be con sitting playing with Kevin Bond and I looked up to him so high with the Hawkins, I was like, this crazy. It was so it was me, Kevin Bond, the Kirk Carr record, Sanctuary. Mm -hmm. They called me to do that. Oof. And it was me, Kevin Bond, Jason White. Jonathan DuBose Oof. and Jeremy Haynes on drums. Yep. It was a historic <laughs> moment. That record blew up. Yeah. So many of the big gospel records, God was allowing me to be on them. Really? And man, that's how I met Kevin, and I just became part of his team, mm -hmm. and we was cutting everybody records. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And it was just, man, here go another situation I'm a part of. And got Kim Burrell, I met her. I met Kim Burrell before any of the records came out. She used to, she came to John P. Key's convention in Houston. And she got a new record that's about to drop. That's from the Blaze Y'all. And she sang those songs at the convention. We all, we looking at her like, oh my God, we couldn't believe what we were hearing, bro. So from that, I met Kim um, back then and then later on started playing with her. Um, and she asked me to do her record live in Memphis. And man, people would be tripping out. Eh, live in Memphis, you had the mistakes on there and it, was, it wasn't the most polished situation. And it wasn't. But the spirit of the record was whew, was that that was the two timeless. best players. The two yeah, drummers. it was me and Volley Spud. Craig, me Spud, Calvin, oh, that, um, I love Jermaine. That. I love that record. Um, yeah. What's my man that played for Kurt? Um, what's my man name? Um, Sean. Sean. Yeah. Sean playing keys. It was it was a history. Natural on guitar yeah. that played with um, Usher. Yeah. He was there. That was his man. We were all there just and the rehearsals. Really, if we had the rehearsals, bro. That was crazy. That's the session. Really. Rodney East, I gotta mention him again. That's my brother, man. He's always put me in situations like he's hooked me up with some big stuff. He hooked me up with the Isley Brothers. I, I've been with them 11 years now. And to be playing with... Is it been 11 years? It's been 11 years, years bro. Jeez. 11 years. And first of all, when he called and said, you wanna play with the Isley Brothers, I almost passed out. <laughs> it was like my favorite band. It's like it's black music, it's Frankie Beverly, it's the Isley Brothers, Earth, Wind & Fire. I said, like, dude, I get to play Groove with you? I get to play Harvest for the World on the, with the rib, with Ernie with standing next Isley to me, with Brothers. Ronald singing it. Right. Dude, who wouldn't want that gig? That's crazy. And to this day, man, we touring and they selling out arenas, bro, because music is it's, it's in a different place. And so all the great music and all the great artists, people want to see them while they living. Yeah. They want to hear that stuff. And man, it's a blessing to be playing with them cats, man. And to be playing that, that music like that, man, it's just... It's beautiful, man. Dude, you it's don't a beautiful stop, thing. Man. Dude, Sharky, I met Sharky at a session for a dude named Bruce on the west side. He was doing a gospel choir. Sharky had a little afro. He was a little skinny dude with a big 335. He's like, he playing guitar. Mm -hmm. 
he didn't have the experience. He just he was just bad. Mm. He sounded like George Benson. And man, I walked in the room to, to do it, and of course, cats, younger cats, looking like, oh, that's Maurice Fitzgerald. So he just staring like, man, I get to play with you, man. I called my daddy and told him I'm playing with you. <laughs> and he's like, man, what I need to do on this session? I said, man, just find a pattern, lock into it, do your thing. He was the young sharky that he's not the shark we know now. Right. And bro, that was my first time I met him. So when he when he started coming into his thing and doing his own thing. Me and Sharky stopped playing local. He stopped playing in my band with the Mofis Project with me, Tony Cazzo, and all that. Mm -hmm. And we, we formed that relationship again. And he just said, man, you've been my dude. I looked at videotapes with you, and I always wanted to play with you. So when I do my band, I want you to... He just had invited me to be in his band. Yes. And it's an honor to me to be like, this great... Let, this dude is a virtuoso guitarist. And out of all the bass players, he could have called Pino, he could have called Jew, yeah, yeah. called anybody to play bass for him. And he let me play bass with him. And we get into, we listen to a lot of music, and he's like, man, we gonna approach it. You ain't gonna be the same bass player that everybody know you for. Mm -hmm. Let's get into this. And we would just listen to music, thinking about different approaches and just changing my style and just having uh, other stuff added to me, the way I approach, even my tones, playing different basses and different things through that situation. Just real music with Isaiah Sharkey, man. Just being able to tour with him. And we go do dates and we've been doing stuff, man. It's been like amazing. I feel like I'm being reinvented through this situation with these young legs with this cat. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he's like, man, I'm glad you with me. You know what I mean? So it's it's a blessing, man, to even still have some type of relevancy relevancy after all these years, man, playing bass. And you know what I mean? I, I had the opportunity to jump in a business venture to to open up a spot that was historic out on the west side called the Touch of the Past. And me and my partners, we basically took the place and, and we renovated it and making it all new but still the same historic feel and yeah. the same concept and even some other bigger things that's gonna happen there. So that's my next thing is having my own, I got my own venue and I'll be bringing like acts in and I'll be doing my stuff with my band, bringing people like yourself, doing stuff musically right here in Chicago when we at the crib. So when we end up touring, we at our spot and we making music and we getting down. And if you live in Chicago, you can drive right off of Mannheim and see it in That's real time. Good.